As night falls over Egypt, on October 31st, 1956, the British and French finally keep their side of the bargain with Israel and begin bombing targets throughout the country. Their military campaign has started, but the immediate and fierce reactions throughout the world already point towards a very messy end. Welcome to a Time Goes chronological documentary series on the Suez Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Last time, Israel launched Operation Kadesh, an invasion of Egypt. And as scripted in their secret deal with Israel, Britain and France issued ultimatums to Egypt and Israel, calling for a ceasefire so they can take over the Suez Canal. But Anglo-French airstrikes never came. This left Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser quietly confident that he will be able to hold out against the invading Israeli force. But this confidence will not last for long. At dusk on the 31st, British bombers take off from Malta and Cyprus to initiate phase one of Operation Musketeer Revise. Scheduled to begin their attacks at 7 p.m. local time, their main target is Cairo West Air Base. But there is one final delay. British Prime Minister Antony Eden learns that American nationals are evacuating near the target. Fearful of what bombing them might do to an already angry US, he hurriedly orders the bombers to divert. British planes go out to attack a range of Egyptian military targets. More French-made jets than Israel actually owns also begin attacks on Egyptian troops in Sinai, signaling France has likewise joined the conflict. The primary aim at this point is to achieve aerial supremacy. Meanwhile, though, the Egyptians are in trouble on the ground. Despite having been an advantage, the single front in Sinai is now a potential death trap. With Israel coming from the east, an Anglo-French invasion from the west will encircle and destroy the Egyptian army. To make matters worse, rumors are flying that British paratroopers have already landed in the Cairo suburbs close to where President Nasser's residence is. Some of his top generals advise him to surrender and give himself up to the British Embassy. But Nasser refuses, and instead orders a general retreat towards the western bank of the Suez Canal. It's obvious that Israel is already on the way to a complete military victory, and so the Egyptian leadership begin preparations for an underground war of resistance. There is also a series of smaller and somewhat confused naval operations. The most significant begins around midnight, with the French Navy bombarding bases around Rafah on North Sinai. It is not really that effective, but it has significant political ramifications. It proves to the IDF, particularly Commander-in-Chief Moshe Dayan, who witnesses the shelling from a nearby position, that the French are more than willing to fight in alliance with Israel. On the flip side, it angers Antony Eden and the British generals. They are very anxious about such a public contradiction to Anglo-French claims that they are merely acting as peacekeepers. They're trying to limit controversy on what is already a controversial mission. Potential civilian targets are strictly off limits, and so is oil infrastructure. But British caution is fooling no one. Outside of Egypt, the political reactions are immediate and they are fierce. In Israel and France, the commencement of hostilities is largely uncontroversial, but it's a different story in Britain. News of the aerial campaign reaches the House of Commons, while MPs are already locked in a fierce debate over the government's Suez policy. The chamber erupts in shouts of protest, with opposition politicians calling for Eden's resignation. Answering forceful questions over whether there was any prior collusion, Eden's Foreign Secretary Selwyn Lloyd responds, and I quote, it is quite wrong to state that Israel was incited to this action by Her Majesty's government. There was no prior agreement between us about it. It is, of course, true that the Israeli mobilization gave some advance warning and we urged restraint upon the Israeli government. So, a government minister has blatantly lied to Parliament, something which in normal circumstances would lead to the Prime Minister sacking them. But it is not just British politicians who were angry the night of the 31st. Aside from New Zealand and Australia, all members of the Commonwealth are firmly against military action, calling into question Britain's leadership of the organization. The Arab states are, of course, deeply displeased with what happens, despite Britain's kind gesture of not blowing up their oil pipelines. Still tied up with the uprising in Hungary, into which they have now moved troops, the Soviet Union continues to only offer 
piecemeal and predictable denunciations of Anglo-French imperialism. But the other superpower, the United States, pulls no punches in its criticism. That evening, President Dwight Eisenhower addresses the American people in a televised speech direct from the Oval Office. He states that he was not consulted in any way before the attack, but stresses that this has not damaged America's alliances with Britain, France, or Israel. He makes clear that the crisis needs to be solved through the UN and that America will have no involvement in the hostilities. But the reconciliatory public attitude hides Eisenhower's private fury at British and French action. And if all of this is not enough to signal to the Sevres collaborators that maybe the odds are against them, the UN Security Council that same night passes the US-backed Resolution 119 calling for an emergency meeting of the UN General Assembly tomorrow afternoon. London, Paris, and Jerusalem are now in a position where they might have to defy or leave the UN if they want to carry on their war. And this war is only going to heat up. The IDF continue their military campaign. As I said earlier, French ships assisted Israel in the bombardment of Rafah or tried to assist because it didn't really do much. Located right on the border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt, controlling Rafah is vital for controlling the Strip itself and neutralizing its threat as a Fedayeen base. It is surrounded by minefields, but the same night as the naval bombardment, the 31st, engineers managed to clear a path and make way for an assault on the town's defenses. By the morning of the 1st, the IDF managed to seize control of the settlement after chaotic nighttime fighting in its surrounding hills. It means that Gaza is now isolated, cut off from Egyptian territory. Meanwhile, the IDF is still trying to capture Umm Qatif, the last remaining Egyptian emplacement within the Hedgehog, the key to vital junctions in northeast Sinai. To Diane's frustration, intense combat continues through the night of the 31st and into daytime on the 1st. But France and Britain finally joining the fight gives Israel the breakthrough it needs. French aircraft rain down napalm, bombs and rockets onto Egyptian defenses. Egyptian forces hold on for as long as possible, but are forced to evacuate just before midnight the first, leaving the entire hedgehog in Israeli hands. With that southern flank secure, Israeli armor is safe from Rafah to the strategically located city of El Arish. They face increasing resistance along the coastal road, but Egyptian resistance is mostly broken at Jaradi Pass. By early morning November 2nd, IDF tanks are ready to assault the city. Already severely mauled, the Egyptian infantry decides to retreat just before dawn. And in the skies above Sinai, phase one of Musketeer Revised continues. Now, in general, the opening evening and nighttime raids from British and French aircraft were somewhat ineffective. But as the sun rises on November 1st, fresh attacks are carried out on multiple Egyptian air bases, soon incapacitating most of Nasser's operational air force, over 200 planes. Supreme Allied Commander General Charles Keitley and the rest of the task force commanders don't actually realize their success though, and continue raids throughout the day. Another objective of theirs is to stop any Egyptian action which might damage or close the canal itself. We've already seen how important the canal is for Western Europe's oil supply. And considering that canal access is one of the main reasons Britain and France engineered this conflict, it's pretty important they are successful here. Unfortunately for them, they are not especially successful. Royal Navy fighters try to disable the cement-laden 320-foot freighter Akka before it reaches position, but they fail. It is sunk in the middle of the canal near the city of Ismailia. It is the first of 32 ships that will soon litter the bottom of the waterway, blocking all access through it. Europe now faces oil shortages as tankers from the Persian Gulf have to travel all the way around Africa and up the Atlantic Ocean. Eisenhower has, as I said last time, already ordered that America provide no assistance in this regard. The economic costs of this war are becoming more and more apparent to those involved. At the same time though, Eisenhower is aware of the tricky position he is in. At a National Security Council meeting on the morning of the 1st, he and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles agree to suspend all military aid and financial assistance to Israel to encourage a ceasefire. But with Britain and France, it's more complicated. They're some of America's closest NATO allies. 
An indictment of them as aggressors would not only sit uncomfortably with the American public, but also threaten a vital alliance at the height of the Cold War. At the same time, however, siding completely with Britain and France could lose the entire Middle East to Soviet influence. In a personal memo to Dulles after the meeting, Eisenhower sums up this position. At all costs, the Soviets must be prevented from seizing a mantle of world leadership through a false but misleading exhibition of concern for smaller nations. Since the Africans and Asians almost unanimously hate one of the three nations, Britain, France, and Israel, the Soviets need only propose severe and immediate punishment of these three to have the whole of two continents on their side. And so Dulles flies to New York to call on the UN General Assembly to propose a resolution strong enough to neuter any Soviet involvement, but conciliatory enough to not lose Britain, France, and Israel as allies. In an impassioned speech, he is careful to stress the deep ties between America and these three friends. But he also leaves no doubt that the violent armed attack by three of our members upon a fourth cannot be treated as other than a grave error, inconsistent with the principles and purposes of the Charter. He goes on to implore that the member states adopt the US-backed resolution, closing with an ominous warning that the crisis may soon flare into a new world war even more destructive than the last one. The speech seems to work. After many hours of deliberation and debate, the UN General Assembly passes Resolution 997 at 2.30 a.m. November 2nd by an overwhelming majority of 64 to 5 with 6 abstentions. It calls for an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of all troops to the 1949 armistice lines, and the halting of all military movement in the area. It also requests that UN member states cease sending all military goods into the region. So the UN has officially called for a ceasefire. Well, what will Britain, France, and Israel do now? In just over 24 hours, the plans laid out in Sevres have already proved deeply controversial. Britain, France, and Israel are isolated on the world stage. The financial implications of the invasion are fast becoming apparent, and America is in no mood to bail anyone out. The public response in Britain has been equally damning, and parliamentary debate becomes so embittered that the session has to be suspended for the first time in 20 years. Will Britain's government fail? Would a new one abandon Israel if it does? Will an oil shortage sabotage the global economy? Will the Soviets enter the fray? Will this lead to a new world war? So many questions, but really, there is so little time for them to be answered. If you'd like to learn more about America's role in another colonial conflict, then have a look at the fourth episode on the Indonesian War of Independence right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Lawrence Ward. It's because of people like you, Lawrence, that we can continue making this great content. So please join the Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.